When I was growing up as a kid, there were a few key pieces of media that I remember sticking out to me in whichever medium they were in. I remember going to see Star Wars Episode 3 with my dad the day it came out. I remember waiting in line for Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows with my grandmother when that came out. And I remember when Pokemon Emerald came out, I got so mad at it, I threw my Game Boy across the room, effectively destroying the Game Boy. But out of all of these, one of the earliest pieces of media I truly remember captivating a nationwide audience was David Chase's HBO television show, The Sopranos. The Sopranos filmed its pilot in 1997, which is the same year I was born. The pilot was then ordered by HBO, and a whole season was produced shortly after, with The Sopranos getting its debut on January 10, 1999. I wasn't even two at the time of its debut, but in the subsequent years, as memories start to form more solidly, I remember the impact it had. My parents watched it every Sunday, sometimes allowing me to watch it with them. The Sopranos was the first show I had heard someone say the F word in, and was kind of a big deal to me at the time. The only time I'd get kicked out of the room was when sex was involved in the show, or what my parents referred to at the time as grown-up kissing. It wasn't until Austin Powers when I found out what grown-up kissing was, but that's a video essay for another day. As a kid, I didn't know the story, but I knew its impact. Flash forward to September 2014 around early senior year of high school. It had been nearly a year since Breaking Bad had ended, and I remember being inspired by that milestone to watch a new show. So, instead of cycling back and forth between rewatching The Office and Always Sunny episodes, I decided I'd give The Sopranos a try. I had remembered its importance all those years, but I hadn't remembered just how immaculate the show was. I was in love. I was in love with the writing, with the acting, with the setting, with the authenticity, with the incessant violence, and most importantly, I was in love with Tony Soprano. I raced through the first five seasons and the first half of the sixth season, but as school started and picked up more speed, I had fallen off halfway through season six. Flash forward another three and a half years to the end of my junior year of college this past year. I had decided to rewatch it, and this time, I was going to finish it. All of those feelings I had almost four years prior had come back and were further reinforced. I was still in love with this show, and I was still in love with Tony Soprano. Around halfway through my series viewing, I started taking a philosophy class on existentialism. In the class, we were required to make a project in which we were to make something creative surrounding themes of existentialism and its underlying topics in the course. At first, I didn't quite know what I was going to do, but as we started the course, one of the first few philosophers that we had encountered, Nietzsche, had been name-dropped by an Anthony Jr., or AJ, in Season 2. Now, what's going on with you? Nothing. Well, you know that no God shit that upset your mother very much. It's not no God. It's just God is dead. Who said that? Nietzsche. He's a 19th century philosopher from Germany. Anyway. As I kept watching the show, I started to piece together that existentialism is a topic that is a sort of overhead figure over the course of the show. I tried to find the perfect topic for which the show strongly emulates whether it was freedom, absurdity, anxiety, or death. But it wasn't until I had retraced my steps to the origins of existentialism where I think I finally figured it out. The Sopranos is about existentialism, but not outright. What I mean by that is, The Sopranos emulates determinism. While it doesn't argue for determinism, 
It shows you how not ideal determinism is by showing you a lifestyle where it is very much real. Before I go on to the meat of my case, I first must explain what existentialism is and what determinism is in relation to that. Existentialism is an area of philosophy that focuses on existence, which, if you're really good at pointing things out that most people wouldn't catch, you'd notice that exist is in the first part of the word existentialism. Existentialism arose in the 18th century with philosophers like Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche, who we've talked about already, being at the front line of the existentialist movement. Existentialism was a backlash to the casual determinism and pure objective reasoning of the natural sciences in the early 18th century. To understand why the backlash happened, let's look at what determinism is. Determinism is pretty much the idea that all of existence is working like clockwork. Everything is arranged. Everything is a cog in a giant wheel that is existence and the universe. Basically, everything is predictable. So, existentialism was pretty much people realizing that nothing is determined and that meaning is created. While I side with existentialism and believe key characteristics such as meaning is created and existence is finite, The Sopranos makes determinism and existentialism seem like two sides of the same coin instead of one backlash to a way of thinking. The Sopranos argues that while there will always be freedom in the world, there will always be determinism too. And it is all shown through Tony Soprano. Now that we're getting into the meat of the video essay, I have to preface that there are spoilers to The Sopranos that follow. But you may as well stick around and listen to a guy who clearly knows what he's talking about and is a self-proclaimed expert on existentialism after taking only one course on the subject. Let's first look at this clip in the first episode of Season 4 titled, For All Debts Public and Private. Tony is talking to his therapist, Dr. Melfi, when he sums up how living as a mobster almost always ends. I've analyzed it. Still endings for a guy like me. High-profile guy. Dead or in a game. Big percent of the time. You've never talked this, frankly. Even with all this terrorism shit, the government has resources up the ass. As far as legal bills... Anthony! What? Why don't you give it up? Oh. In the mob, very seldom do top players get away with their crimes, whether the consequences be from within the mob by death, or outside of the mob through criminal prosecution inevitably leading to jail. In the life of a mobster, everything is determined. Tony says it best once again. And what difference would it make? You said so yourself. It's in the blood. It's hereditary. Genetic predispositions are only that, predispositions. It's not a destiny written in stone. People have choices. She finally offers an opinion. Well, they do. You think that everything that happens is preordained? You don't think that human beings possess free will? How come I'm not making fucking pots in Peru? You're born to this shit. You are what you are. This scene perfectly encapsulates the dichotomist relationship between existentialism and determinism that the show emulates. There are certain ways of life that represent and express freedom. However, it is within the mob and similar organizations where things are more determined for you. This last scene also touches on something that is an essential facet of existentialism. Freedom. When it comes to the existentialist view of freedom, there are two points that are important when looking at the Sopranos and determinism slash freedom. The first point is that people fear freedom. The second point is that freedom entails personal responsibility. These two points go hand in hand. People fear freedom because freedom entails personal responsibility. And that's why it's easier for mobsters like Tony Soprano to live a more deterministic lifestyle. Because they believe they themselves aren't responsible for their actions. If someone had to get whacked, they had to get whacked. It was business. The mobsters killing whoever is getting whacked don't believe they need to be held responsible for their action in killing. They believe the person being killed is responsible for doing whatever they did to get them in that situation. To them, it's just business. It's easier and more comforting to gangsters to live in a more determined lifestyle than it is to live in a freer one. In order to fully touch on the point of people fearing freedom, we need to look at an arc that is told in the first half of the sixth and final season of The Sopranos. So, this part is where the spoilers start to come in. But again, even if you haven't seen The Sopranos, you should stick around. I am an expert on this. By season six, Tony has been promoted from underboss to full-on boss of the North Jersey crime family. His uncle, Corrado, Jr. Soprano, 
starting to suffer from early signs of dementia, Uncle Junior could no longer run the family, so Tony assumed the role. At the end of the season premiere, Uncle Junior goes into an episode of his dementia, and he thinks his nephew is a home intruder, ultimately shooting Tony, sending him into a coma as he recovers in the hospital. While he is in the coma, Tony's dreams have him thinking he is another man, named Kevin Finnerty. In this new identity, Tony, or rather Kevin, is all that Tony isn't. He doesn't have that thick Jersey accent and is by all accounts a free man. What's important about the Kevin Finnerty arc is that this personality, this lifestyle, this freedom, is all unattainable for Tony in real life. It is only attainable for Tony through death. Only through death can Tony achieve freedom. And that death, under the lifestyle Tony has chosen, is set to be determined for him. In this scene, Trinity approaches the Finnerty reunion, which is a packed house with a lot of people in it. All the while this is going on, Tony is fighting for his life in real life. As Kevin approaches the house and is greeted by Steve Buscemi, who played Tony's cousin, Tony Blundetto, whom Tony Soprano had to kill in the season 5 finale, Steve Buscemi informs Finnerty that his family is waiting for him inside. As Finnerty gets closer to the front door, Buscemi informs him that he can't bring his briefcase into the party, stating, you can't bring business in there. The opening is a clear allegory for death and the other side. When Buscemi says that he can't bring business in there, he means that Tony can't live the lifestyle he lives if he wants freedom. Finnerty doesn't want to get rid of the briefcase. He doesn't want to let go. He is afraid of the freedom. He is used to the determinism. He is used to his life and does not want freedom because he fears it. Before Finnerty can make a decision, Tony comes out of the dream for a second and survives the episode in the hospital. Finnerty, or Tony, was close to being able to go to the other side. That decision was one of the freest situations Tony has witnessed, and he doesn't welcome it. As soon as he starts to realize the weight of his situation, his lifestyle, and what going on to the other side means, what his possible freedom means, he starts to opt out and inevitably gets what he wants. Following this, Tony gets out of the coma, recovers, and eventually the season turns into an all-out war between Tony's North Jersey crime family and one of the five New York crime families, the fictional Lupertazzi family that exists in the show. For my final point to bring it all together, let's look at the series finale. As the show comes to an end, as people are getting whacked left and right, Tony finally kills Phil Leotardo, the boss of the Lupertazzi crime family, with the blessing of members of the Lupertazzi family. Earlier in the season, AJ attempts to murder his uncle Junior for the attempted murder on his father. AJ is detained, but with his father being a mob boss with great control over several members of law enforcement with several connections, AJ surprisingly gets away with it. Tony then reprimands him and has an emotional moment with his son in the parking lot of the police station. Stupid fucking moron! You realize what could have happened to you? We didn't have connections? Some cop goes by the book and they charge you with attempted murder. You hear me? Attempted murder, then what? Then what? Tony shot you! You just gonna let him fucking get away with it? I told you that's my business, not yours! And what did you do? Nothing! Zero, a big fucking jerk off! Fuck you! Oh, you little prick your fucking neck! Stop crying. Stop crying. I guess your heart was in the right place, AJ. But it's wrong. Come on. What? It's not in your nature. You don't know me. And you don't know anything about me. You're a nice guy. And that's a good thing, for Christ's sakes. Bullshit. I mean it. You're a good guy, and I'm very grateful. Well, you're a fucking hypocrite. Like, right, cause every time we watch Godfather, when Michael Corleone shoots those guys in the restaurant, those assholes who tried to kill his dad, you sit there with your fucking bowl of ice cream and you say it's your favorite scene of all time. Jesus Christ, AJ. And you make me want to cry. It's a movie. This scene and the scene in The Godfather that AJ is referring to are important to understanding the finale. In The Godfather, 
Michael Corleone hides a gun in the restaurant bathroom of where he is supposed to have a sit-down with the two men who attempted a hit on his father, Don Corleone. Michael enters the bathroom, grabs the gun, and shoots both of them dead. With that in mind, let's look at the series finale. The finale is still discussed to this day as many people were taken aback by its abrupt ending which was jarring to many across the world. Tony sits down at a restaurant, chooses the oh-so-famous Don't Stop Believin' by Journey to be played over the speaker. As he waits for his family, every time the entrance to the diner opens, a bell rings and he looks up. His wife, Carmela, arrives. The door opens again. He looks up. A man enters the diner with AJ following directly after. AJ sits down and has a short anecdote with his father about the diner's onion rings. The man that preceded AJ is sitting at the bar. He looks around with his vision finally landing on Tony. Outside, Tony's daughter Meadow arrives and starts to parallel park in the street. The family gets their drinks. The man looks at Tony again. AJ starts complaining about his job, to which Tony says, buck up. AJ responds with, right, focus on the good times. Tony takes this as sarcasm, but it's really a callback to the season 1 finale where Tony tells his family the same thing. Tony agrees with the sentiment. Meadow is still struggling with parallel parking outside, along with everyone else in the world who has ever had to parallel park. The man gets up from the bar and enters the bathroom, and the bell is rung, but this time Tony doesn't look up. His guard is down. Tony's family gets their onion rings. Meadow runs for the restaurant entrance. The door opens. The bell is rung. Tony looks up and Tony is finally free.